Good morning. Um, the story goes that Netflix began with a second-hand Patsy Cline CD and a 32-cent stamp. As Reed Hastings and his co-founder Mark Randolph tested the durability of CDs in the rough and tumble of the US mail system. Now Reed is in the rough and tumble of the SVOD revolution. And Netflix is worth $125 billion, roughly, give or say, and has 150 million users and counting. The question is, is it counting fast enough? It was the remake of the British classic House of Cards that made Netflix's name. And now, for the first time at RTS Cambridge, but I certainly hope not for the last, I'm joined by the man some say is the most powerful person in world TV. But before we talk to Reed Hastings, let's see what Netflix has been up to in the UK over the past year. Uh, welcome, Reed Thank Hastings. You. I'd like you. to have you. Can we have the lights up a bit more for this session? Because I'm going to start the conversation with Reed, but I very much uh, hope that all of you will have questions to ask Reed as well. I mean, that was a you know, pretty incredible uh, tape there. So, what's the plan for the UK market in the coming year? Yeah, we've had a good start. Um, we look forward to doing a lot more with all of you. Um, the possibilities the internet brings um, for growing the entertainment is phenomenal. And over the next several years, um, with all of the expansion, I think we're gonna see a very large increase in how much content is produced uh, here in the UK. And that presents a lot of opportunities and a lot of challenges in terms of capacity and training and development. Um, but far better to deal with the challenges of more content <clears throat> than the challenges of uh, empty stages. So, so do you have a kind of budget in mind for what you might spend here next year? <laughs> well, see, this year we spent a little over 400 million pounds. In the um, UK? In the UK. Um, and that's continuing to grow following our subscriber base. And, you know, as you know, the UK has had such a long and strong storytelling uh, uh, expertise, you know, really probably driven by the early BBC yeah. investments and then all the competition for the BBC, uh, that now there's such a, a powerful and, and strong infrastructure that it's the biggest place that Netflix develops content outside of the US. Yeah. So 400 million last year, double this year? This, no, 400 million this year. Double next year? Um, probably not double, but a big increase. So what we have now is deep pockets. You bought the studio capacity at Shepperton. We did a long-term lease. Long-term yeah. lease, yes. Um, you've taken up talent. You've got, uh, you know, Peter Morgan. Supporting talent. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You've got, <laughs> like all these kind of verbs being corrected. It's great. Yeah. So, not taking talent, supporting talent. That's right. Uh, you, your only big acquisition so far is my friend Mark Miller's Miller World. You yeah. Know, that was a big. Yeah. What well, in 20 years we've done one acquisition, which is Miller World. Miller World. World. Um, the word is you're after a facilities house in the UK, but that might be wrong. Uh, is it wrong? I, yeah, we're not in the acquisition business. We're in so, uh, That's the facilities house, but would you be, are you more interested in looking at individual talent or might you be in the market like so many others are for production companies? No, we've never bid on a production company. Um, we want to use many production companies, and there's a lot of expertise in all the markets around the world. Um, so that's not a uh, particular part of our plan. So when you're looking at working with production companies, I know you've got a pretty good hub in London now, but is, right. is there going to be a kind of spread out over the UK? You know, of course, the big drive for Channel 4 and BBC is to look much more holistically at the whole of the UK. And I know you're filming everywhere from... Edinburgh to Norwich, but are you actually yeah. going to put sort of scouts out in those areas? Are you going to actually have hubs in those areas? You know, we would tend to do like shows like Sex Education, um, you know, that we did in Wales, uh, Al Law King in Scotland, you know, on location. Right. I, I don't know about, again, fix, we're really about trying to find great stories, not so much about locations and buildings. Um, you need some of those to be able to do great stories. Uh, but we're not trying to create factories. We're trying to find boutique specialty things from all through the UK. So you're actually looking individually at different uh, independent production companies that you might be interested in working with. And we have and continue to do that, yeah. So um, you must be worried in a way about the SVOD explosion because just this week, you know, we've got Peacock, you know, you've got Apple uh, coming on in uh, November, you've got Disney Plus. 
And the competition in a way for Netflix is twofold because there you were ahead of the game and you were licensing you know, you know, shows like big anchor shows sure. like Friends. So therefore they're not only being taken away but you've actually got other people after content. Now they've got wads of actual cash, actual cash, not debt, <laughs> wads of actual cash to spend. <laughs> Are they in a, uh, in, a, in a better position to do, uh, do a bit of business than you are or not really? You know, it is fair to say that um, while we've been um, competing with many people over the last decade, it's a whole new world um, starting in November <coughs> for next year between um, Apple launching and Disney launching and of course Amazon is ramping up. Uh, Peacock, um, so there's tremendous new competition. A lot of them have very deep pockets. Um, but you know, you, sometimes you do your best work when you're really challenged. Um, you know, and we love Disney as a company. We've always admired them. We've always admired HBO. Our greatest dream in the beginning was to be used in the same sentence with HBO. And when that first happened with House of Cards, it was such an honor. And now, um, you know, to be like Disney and make contributions in multiple areas, uh, it's a great thing. So it'll be tough competition, no question. Consumers will have a lot of choice. Uh, all of you producing, again, this is going to be unbelievable in the next couple of years because you'll get to bid your, your titles across multiple players seeking to break right. in to compete with Netflix. Then we'll raise the bid to try to hold on to great content. So um, it, it's going to be You're gonna uh, fantastic. You're going to have to pay more for your talent. You're going to have to yep. pay more for your content. Yep. Yep. Someday the crown will look like a bargain. <laughs> Was a bargain, wasn't it? Not yet. <laughs> subscribers I mean you're talking about 150 million you, you need you need about 250 million don't you and you've built in the American in, in the American North American market your growth has to be elsewhere uh, and you know we were just hearing yesterday on discovery they're going local 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 you need to make shows I mean we're really talking primarily about Britain but you really need to make shows around the world for around the world don't you I mean you need to be big in Asia um, you know, La Casa de Papel was our Spanish show. That was yes. a big success. Protector um, out of Istanbul, um, Dark out of Germany, of course, all the U.S. shows. So, yeah, we're producing all over the world. Um, but, you know, what we're trying to do in, in the U.K. is really have a set of shows that are provocative, diverse, uh, interesting, novel, uh, creative, things that we all talk about. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because, you know, the old uh, model, if you can call it the old model of Netflix, uh, was that uh, you know rights were not up for grab. But I hear now that you're being much more open about these things, and it's you know you trade rights, you'll do all sorts of stuff now, and you probably have to because we're, we're the others will to, do it. We're trying to grow up a little, yeah. So you know we it, we are definitely guilty of uh, having been a little simplistic when we started, of like oh this is how we work and. Um, we're trying to learn. Um, we're doing things like now sharing data with producers about how the shows do. That's yeah. new this year. Do you think you were too secretive in the beginning? Yeah. But, you know, the thing about, uh, you know, when, <clears throat> when, we when we went public, which was 2002, we were 50 million in revenue and Blockbuster was 5 billion. Uh, and we had this long, long, you know, I fight that we, we, we barely, we, we barely came out of. And so you learn all these defensive, uh, fearful things about hiding information and, you know, the things that made us successful then are things that can trip us up over time as we get large. So we have to just grow up into it and, and be more open. And, and that's also being driven by, by, as you say, the new competition. I mean, you've got at least eight SVODs and counting coming on. Um, the price point for Apple will be below yours. Um, you know, there's a saying in America, which is, um, if you're not eating, you are on the menu. So <laughs> are you going to be one of the ones that's going to be eating or one of the ones that's going to be on the menu? Because, you know, somebody's going to be on the menu. It's easy to think of SVOD as a market, but when you talk to consumers uh, about some night they're not watching Netflix and you ask them, what are you doing if you're not watching Netflix? Of course, linear TV is a big part, mm -hmm. um, but so is video gaming, yeah. uh, Fortnite, um, so is YouTube. That's, so YouTube is seven times more viewing than we have uh, around the world. Does that upset you? So it does. Um, <laughs> and, 
So you, we, yeah, I, I'm just encouraging you to think of the competitive lens yeah. of like all things people do to relax and there's, you know, in the home, or you can think of it as TV screen time. Um, and in our uh, most developed market in the US, where about 10% of the time a television is on, it's playing Netflix, yeah. and the rest of the time, again, video gaming, linear yeah. TV. In the UK, we think it's about 5%. Um, and so th this whole idea of eat or be eaten, I think what's happening is there's many options and there's many success stories. Yes, but many consumers don't have deep pockets. And what they're going to do is they're going to make a decision, and I would imagine I would imagine, I might be wrong, but that you know, consumers are probably going to go for two subscriptions, max three. That means that a, a mm. number of you are not going to survive. What do you think the, either the aggregation or indeed the, you know, or the, what, what will actually happen? Because you're not all going to be there. There's going to have to be movement in the market. You know, it's going to be interesting how that works out. Um, when, like Apple when Flix? When employees ask me. Hulu Net. What am I scared of? The main thing I'm scared of is that employees will focus on competitors. Yeah. There's nothing we can do about them. And the competition, again, it's video gaming, it's YouTube, it's the SVODs, it's linear. And so what we have to focus on is how do we please our members? This is why we're so firm about when we make movies of releasing them on our service first. We're programming for our members. Our members are paying for the content. And then it's up to us to take their money and convert it into shows that people want to watch. But you do want to make a splash because, in fact, what you're doing is you're closing uh, the, the London Film Festival with Irishman, which I gather is going to be on a big screen release for four weeks before it comes to your audience. You do want to make a splash. I mean, one of the most striking things to me was um, Roma, which was amazing. Thanks. It cost 15 million to make but you spent 25 million preparing it for blasting out for the Oscars, so you do want to make a splash. We do want to gain attention and support our talent. Quaron took a, yeah. uh, a bet with us, and um, we want to give him the best platform, Marty Scorsese on Irishman. Yep. Um, we got an incredible movie, Two Popes, coming out um, this fall too, a marriage story. So we're, we're super, you know, we started strong in series, now we're trying to expand into film. What about the whole question of you know, dealing with the culture and so forth in, 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 in the company and how you want to progress? I mean, I think it's interesting because you know, you're saying yourself that you were seen as a much more secretive, you know, not quite the dark arts, but all these figures, the data. Uh, but actually, the openness is actually much more part of what the UK is about in terms of the industry. And, and, and so are you actually actively changing the culture in Netflix? Now you've got great people in the UK that perhaps have a different modus uh, operandi. Yeah, we're trying to figure out how to be open about you know, how the shows are doing, how we operate. When um, you're cancelling them quickly. Um, we should be open about that too. And uh, we're trying to spend our members' money well. So when we cancel the show, unfortunately, it's because we think it's better to give somebody else a chance uh, with that money to do a new show. Um, so the, the key thing is constantly thinking about are we spending the member, members' money in the best way possible. So let's just to look at the financial model because you do have a huge burden of debt. Uh, These are your FT figures. Um, 10.4 billion long term, uh, 19 billion obligations, 2.5 billion unknown spending. That probably equates to about $32 billion. But for the first time in July, you did lose subscribers. Clearly, we're paying too much for content. <laughs> That's not the right answer. <laughs> the answer is you've got to grow your subscription massively, is the answer. Because if you don't move forward, then the wheels come off. Absolutely, yeah. And the internet's an amazing uh, phenomena. It's you know once in a very long time, mm -hmm. and we are definitely leaning forward uh, into doing more content for our members in the future. Um, and the growth has been very steady for the last uh, 10, 15 years, um, as more and more people uh, discover the benefits of uh, online. Mm -hmm. um, so that is the bet. But yeah, that is the bet. But you have to show this because the market cap can change. You know, as we all know, like practically overnight. So you've got to be thrusting forward. So presumably you have to move in the markets where you think you've got most to <coughs> offer. What, you, what, what content translates best? Because I'm just thinking a lot of British content does translate very well globally. 
You know, Top Boy is uh, number one on Netflix today. Um, back to the openness, we've started testing uh, top 10 um, here in the UK. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a very tough issue with all of the knife violence that's in, you know, society today. Um, but we think it's important to, you know, provide this platform and it's a very diverse cast. Yeah. Um, so you're, gonna show, you're going to share more data about uh, figures, but the trouble is you, you have to look at figures over, you can't just do like, uh, we sort of look at the overnight sometimes, but you're going to be looking yeah. at much. Gonna, are you going to share data on how things are doing right through what we would old fashionedly call a season? You don't have seasons anymore, do you? Sure, I mean, I think that the best solution is to have Barb or Comscore extend their technology to right. be able to report in a consistent way, because right. nobody wants to rely on us for reporting on our figures. Um, but to the degree that Barb can just do an open measurement of their panel, that, that's um, that would be the, the, the right solution. So that's what you're heading for? That's well, it's not us. Barb has to do it. They just have to recognize but, the show. But you're going to be open. That would be great for us, yep, great. And, and, um, and great for everyone. Now, um, this new spirit of openness, I mean, you know Tony Hall. We know you had a drink with Tony Hall last night. You were wandering Cambridge this morning with Alex Mayon. Um, you've got good friends in, SM, in um, PSBs, but are you long-term friend or foe to the PSBs, do you think? Well, a little bit of both. Um, we compete for uh, viewing and uh, push people to do, you know, all four and iPlayer and, you know, move people to the internet. So that's a challenge to the model. And then we do co-productions. Uh, we've got Watership Down and Dracula with um, BBC. Um, bodyguard that bodyguard, ITV made yeah. <coughs> for both of us. Um, and in that way, we increase the budget. And it's not just us, it's our also the SVOD competitors. So over time, when PSBs you know, want to develop so, a show. That's so interesting, because so, um, I wonder if you think <laughs> the PSBs are going to get addicted, to, or maybe already addicted to your money as well. Well, I hope so. <laughs> you know. They want uh, to take the, your that, money and that, not Apple's money oh, and well, not uh, Peacock's money. They want, I mean, this is what No, no, they'll. About. Those other companies will, will be bidding and active, and Amazon has been too, and uh, Fleabag is a uh, you know, great show, and it's an Amazon original. Yes. We got outbid for that one. So look, is that I'll, a real uh, regret? Is, if it was yeah, that's a great show. That's if a it was a show, show that you wish you had, is that the one? That's the one. Great. So you know, the good thing about it is there's multiple bidders, and that helps everybody feel comfortable with it. J just checking, are you after Phoebe Waller-Bridge for a talent deal? I don't know. Are you after other talent deals at the moment? You could say that, but I couldn't possibly <laughs> comment. That's a line from a show. <laughs> anyway, you've been incredibly open so far. We have at least 11 minutes left, and so I'm really keen to get lots of questions. Up there at the back, down here. Gosh, this is an auction. Down here. Let's take the, the guy at the back. Hi. <clears throat> Hi, Ben Fenton from Edelman. Uh, we did some research, which was uh, shown to everybody in, in the room yesterday, that showed that Netflix is as trusted by British consumers as any of the PSBs, mm. by the BBC or ITV or Channel 4. Is that just sort of coincidental to your strategy as a company, or do you think that trust is something that you've got to work hard to maintain? Uh, or is your attitude just the more you entertain people, the more they'll buy your product? Yeah, our fundamental brand would be around being loved more than being trusted. I think a news brand um, needs to be trusted, and we're definitely not news, not sports, not video gaming. Um, and PSBs have a particularly high um, role to play in news. Um, so again, for us, trust is a little bit, it's always good to be trusted, but it's a little bit ancillary as opposed to loved. Um, and so that's not the core attribute. Question over here, please. Josie, I'm Simon Walker from Marquee TV. Um, I'm the founder of a niche SVOD service that focuses on performing arts, dance, opera, theater. Um, and when we launched last year, the FT called us Netflix for the arts. And some of my savvier investors went, well, hold on, won't Netflix be Netflix for the arts? Um, so I guess my question is, um, do you see a future for niche, super niche passion SVOD services? And if the answer is no, can we all agree that we're not going to tell my investors? <laughs> um, is, what's your price point? Eight ninety nine or eight ninety eighty nine ninety nine a year. Um, but it's super premium. It's the Royal Opera House, Royal Shakespeare Company, National Theatres, high end. 
Yeah, the more things are super premium or live, the less sense they make the more, for us. The, our brand really is around binge viewing, around watching a movie in the middle of the night, um, a show all day. That's why we're not sports, not live. I mean, that's sort of a crossover case. But certainly no current plans to go into anything uh, like that. Okay, question here. Uh, hi, good morning. Um, Jeff Norton. My question, Kirsty, you asked about culture briefly. And I'm really curious. I think we've all probably read the culture deck. It's a famous you know, piece of, uh, of literature. And, and what I'm interested in is, as you've expanded, read around the world, different continents, uh, new employees, rapid expansion, how do you ensure consistency of culture? And at the same time, how do you evolve the culture? You mentioned about sort of growing up a little bit. I think it's a really interesting challenge. Yeah, it definitely is. I mean, we've been um, expanding around the world. I would say within Europe, there's not too many tensions around the culture of directness and honesty and all of that. I would say in Asia, we've had to make some adjustments. Um, you know, the respect for hierarchy and age is very much to be, to give direct criticism is hard, to give direct criticism in front of colleagues is kind of like, I don't know, coming to work naked or something for us. You know, that it's like, what? That Netflix on Friday. <laughs> yeah. So, um, there we've made some adjustments, but I think many people thirst for the freedom and responsibility, the idea that you get to make your own choices. So, our local commissioners um, here in the UK get to make decisions and and they're accountable for total budget, but they don't have to get approval from, so from anyone. Well. Big checks and make deals and, you know, they get, you know, complete autonomy. And then there's a responsibility to spend the customer's money well. Uh, but, you know, that's judged over multiple things and multiple times. So we're definitely away from the micromanagement. I often say, you know, the job is to inspire people, not to manage them. Or I say to employees, don't try to please your boss. Okay, try to serve the customer and fill your boss in on what you're doing, but your North Star has to be to produce great content or to you know, have a great service um, and then explain to your manager why you've made those choices. Yeah. So, so those are the differences. Question in the middle, thank you. Uh, hi, Reid. Chris Curtis, um, the editor of Broadcast Magazine. Um, to what extent is Netflix going to be prepared to experiment with release models for content? So you're doing something different with rhythm and flow, um, you're moving into non-scripted uh, more generally, and some of your uh, forthcoming competitors, Disney, have talked about doing weekly drops rather than box setting and binge viewing. What will Netflix's approach to be towards uh, potentially experimenting around release models? You know, experimenting is the right word. Um, rhythm and Flow is a competition show, so we'll, we'll play around with that. Um, you know, we're doing experimental stuff like Bandersnatch that's a uh, branch narrative. Um, but on the core model, uh, the binge viewing is the essence of what consumers love about Netflix. We think it's a better model. Um, we'll definitely be sticking with that. Um, and I know people say that, it, or like with the movies, we want to release them as soon as possible on Netflix. Um, and they may have a qualifying run for theatrical, but it's fairly small. Uh, and again, we're always trying to please our members because that's how we grow. Question at the front. Hello, Tom McWilliam from Enabling Abilities. Are you scared of Sharon's up and coming regulations on uh, AD and subtitles uh, for X Lodge services? Mm -hmm. And number two is how are you going to make your service more accessible to people who uh, need help to? get round your service. Yeah, we've been at the forefront of accessibility and the internet kind of allows that because instead of choosing uh, how, what language or subtitles uh, or audio description, you can let users choose and have multiple different tracks. So we've got audio description. Uh, we've been working in the US um, with the various uh, deaf and, and uh, limited sight organizations to improve the access. And again, it's the power of the internet to be able to do that and we're by far the leader in uh, all those capabilities. If there's regulations for it, of course, we'll comply with those. Um, but I would I think in every market, we're substantially ahead of the regulation. Okay, gentleman here. Oh, oh ooh, uh, hello. Reed Kenton Allen from Big Talk Productions. I'm just curious to um, ask you about the, the, the strategy going forward as you begin to lose shows that you have in volume, like The Office and Friends. Um, what the strategy is going to be about getting to volume 
you don't have 200 episodes of, of lots of your shows. So how do you balance the desire to keep feeding a show that the audience desperately want with the, with the need to constantly refresh and bring us something new every day? You know, when we uh, first did House of Cards, people said, why don't you just license content? And we would say, because eventually all those content companies are gonna be direct to consumer. Mm -hmm. So we've been preparing for this moment since 2012 um, by building up the capacity, uh, movies, television shows, and we feel good now about shifting our consumer's money and instead of licensing those shows, uh, creating new shows. So you might be actually uh, offering a commission now for something like a run of 40 or 50. It, we would typically, that's a big bet up front, and you want to see how the show's coming together. Even Friends and Office started with a season and then um, goes on that basis. But, you know, we've got, now got seven seasons of Orange is the New Black, and that's, you know, just this incredible favorite around the world, and yet lots of people still haven't seen it. So we've got a great franchise there. We've got Grace and Frankie that uh, went seven seasons. We've so done we, a Seinfeld deal, no. And we've done a Seinfeld deal that won't start till 2021. Right. Um, so that's, you know, some, yeah, yeah. but think of it as the core strategy is what we've been preparing for for a long time because we've known this is coming. In fact, we're a little bit surprised it took this long. So have you got uh, lots of uh, secrets up your sleeve of programs that are ready to rock? There are a lot of great shows that haven't been announced yet, um, but um, there's a lot of great ones uh, like Crown Season 3's November 17th yeah. that, you know, are in the beginning of the franchise building stage yeah. and are very promising, and uh, so we're super excited about those. Front row, thank you. Ali Russell, RTS, Bursary student. I was going to ask, <clears throat> what advice would you give to young creatives trying to create the actual content mm -hmm. for Netflix? like from the age of 19 to 24, like yeah. very young. Yeah, I mean, YouTube's the great staging ground. Film festivals, if you're doing film instead of series, um, those are places that we scout a lot of looking for talent and um, uh, to provide that, that opening. Um, and Sex Education's a good example of a 24-year-old that was the writer on that show and pulled that together. So there's a, a lot of great examples. Uh, far be it for me to say, but I do know that on even on the top boy um, sets, you had young people that then you were then going to put into employment once they trained. So you're doing your own different training model. That's right. That's right. We're investing, you know, that's particularly diversity focused. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's all, all around. Look, the whole industry is there's a shortage of yeah. every role. I heard Divine was saying yesterday there's a real problem with it now. You've got so much stuff being made and not enough. Well, people. the problem is wages are going up. I mean, you know, if you're production, I guess that's a problem, but it's, it's great for the people. Um, and because of that, it's attracting more people in. Great. Okay, question here, and then one at the back's the final. Thank you. Uh, Tara Conlan, right for the RTS and The Guardian. Um, could I ask Alex um, from Channel 4 said earlier this, um, during the conference, there's a growing concentration of power in the hands of just a few tech behemoths who increasingly want to decide what we read, watch and listen to. What do you say to the public service broadcasters here to allay their fears in that regard? And David uh, Zaslav said yesterday that Netflix you know, has 150 million people who pay but you know, do nothing else. Are you going to follow that, um, their model, a discovery, and try and get some more revenue streams from your members? Um, on the second one, no, we're focused on growing our subscription base, pleasing our members, sort of that one business, uh, very simple um, and highly scalable. And in terms of too much power, that can be a risk in a society, definitely, and you know, we need to be aware of that. Again, <clears throat> today we only win about 5% of television viewing hours, um, so it's nowhere near a concentration risk. Um, and then we're definitely um, trying to be supportive of like iPlayer becoming uh, very popular. Uh, all four um, uh, public broadcasters around the world are moving to the internet because mm -hmm. that's where the young people are, that's where their societies are going. And if they move their viewers, then they maintain political support for license fees and government funding and can be a very successful outcome. And if you remember, of course, the BBC started as a radio station and then expanded to TV, and there's no reason it won't successfully expand with iPlayer, which is one of the leading uh, technologies in the world. Well, it just reminds me, um, uh, the, the chair of the London Film Festival was saying, particularly in terms of female writers and directors, there was you know, far too many of the big movies are still being made by men. 
And I wonder if you see in any way that you can make a cultural shift or you don't necessarily think that's your job, or actually do you think it's your job to make a cultural shift in terms of diversity, including employing far more women as senior movie directors? No, it's a huge responsibility and we've got more female directors, uh, female writers, mm -hmm. uh, all, all the way through the system and also below the line in all the camera operating positions and um, so uh, we're very committed there. Um, and again, not just on gender, sexual orientation, yeah. race, nationality. Right, one more final question then we're out. So up the back. Hi Reid, how you doing? I'm from University of York and um, I just had a couple of things I wanted to say. Firstly was thank you for your great service. Um, I think I speak for everyone when I say it's absolutely fantastic, thank you. And secondly, I want to say as an American, um, I got to, uh, you're an American so I've got to ask, why don't we have the West Wing on UK Netflix? Thank you. Uh, I think that uh, West Wing's an NBC show, yeah. if I remember, um, and so they're keeping it uh, for you for Peacock. Um, it's natural for every developer uh, to, to do that. And what we hope on Netflix is to always have an, so, an, enough great content, yeah. some of which you'll hate and some of which you'll love. You're not going to love everything, um, but quite an amazing variety so that you always know it's interesting. I think with that, we should say thank you very, very much to Reed Hastings. Thank, thank you very you. much. Well done. Thank you.